As much as I'm ashamed to talk about this, we gotta bring this up. Some tricksters will try to humiliate you with this colorless checkmate, and you gotta know how to punish them. Now, first of all, you probably are aware of this colorless checkmate. This is something that white can try doing here after pawn e4, pawn e5, and white can go forward with queen h5, hitting this pawn right away. So that gives white the first chance to somehow trick you. Let's say if you lightheartedly play g6, which would be a terrible blunder, white would just play queen take c5, attacking both the king and the rook, and thus winning the game right away. Of course, that's not what you should do. Therefore, here in this position, after white just played queen to h5, hitting this pawn, you need to defend it, and therefore black goes knight c6. Now this pawn is guarded, but white continues to attack with the bishop c4, and this time the threat is real, it's queen takes f7. For example, one of common errors of black would be playing knight f6, attacking the queen, but the queen just goes forward, queen takes f7, and that is what is known as this caller's checkmate. Now, definitely you, wanna, you don't want to go here just as well instead we need to block the diagonal by playing pawn g6 and you know at first it seems like well that's just about it that's end that's the end you secured yourself from the scores checkmate you refuted white's premature attack and everything should be great but it's not that simple actually a lot of white players including some strong players keep playing this variation because here after the queen simply drops back to f3 white saves a somewhat attacking position and it looks like nothing terrible really happened to white Moreover, after black covers this pawn, because queen takes f7 is a real threat, with something like knight f6, because you have these weaknesses around your, you know, king potentially after your castle, white can still try to take advantage of that in the future, by playing something like d3, you know, bishop g5, maybe the knight can come here to d5, I mean, in the future, not necessarily right now, and so white can still try to attack you, right, and they uh, tried this shot at checkmating you just in four moves, if it didn't work, cool, they just turn to a more uh, longer term attack, right? And uh, Nakamura used to play this system a lot with white, uh, nowadays Firuja plays it in Blitz and other people as well, even Magnus played it once and actually achieved a winning position, although lost the game ultimately. So it's not as, you know, beginner level stuff as it may seem at first. Again, a lot of white players would keep playing this. So let's figure it out together how you should punish white for trying this unsound attack against you. Now here, after you just played knight of six, it is white to move. And white should really keep an eye on your threat to go knight d4. Because from there, the knight will attack the queen as well as this pawn on c2, and that's something uncomfortable. Therefore, in most cases, white will either control this square by playing c3 or knight e2. And we're gonna analyze both of them. Let's start with knight e2, which is actually a better option. Because now white also combines development and takes control of this square. What do you do after that? Well, since you have this pawn on g6, you do want to fiend cat of your bishop and to solidify your position on the king side. After that, I play something like pawn d3, and here is the first important little nuance. A lot of players play here d6, which is wrong, and you'll see why in a second. Instead, I recommend that you castle and just secure your king completely. Now, usually, White players will continue playing bishop g5, trying to create this pin and put more pressure on you in the future. And again, if you don't know how to react, it can be quite annoying. What I suggest that you do is just to play pawn h6 right away. As soon as they play bishop g5, you hit it with h6. If white ever tries to trade here, that's not a problem at all. You can trade queens if you want, or you can recapture with the bishop. In both cases, you have nothing to worry about, your position is completely fine. But that's not what white usually does here. Usually they'll go back trying to maintain the pain. And that is actually, strangely enough, a decisive mistake for white. Can you believe that? <laughs> if you know how to take advantage of that, you're gonna crush white. What's wrong with the move bishop h4? Well, it allows you to keep pushing here with the move pawn g5, pushing this bishop all the way back to g3, and it's kind of stuck there. As you can see, it can't move anymore, so you kind of locked it there and you expand it on the king side. Since you're also ahead in development, you don't have to worry about this little weakness, White well, won't be able to take advantage of this anyway. And now your plan would be to strike in the center. That's the general strategic rule. When your opponent tries attacking you on the side, you get a counter strike in the center. And therefore, as soon as you developed and you secured your position, your next way of thinking should be how do I counter attack in the center of the board? Ideally, that's what you want to do. And in this particular case, you can strike in the center with the move pawn d5. And that's the reason why we avoided playing d6 earlier, because in some variations you can hit in the center with the move d5, and that's what you really want. So if possible, you really would love to play the, the pawn move there, and attack white, attack the bishop, attack uh, here the pawn on e4. 
Uh, what is White going to do about that? Well, uh, at first, looks like White can just win the pawn here by capturing. And they will do that. Now, you cannot recapture because it, it's defended twice with White's queen and bishop. But you've got an interesting intermediate move, bishop g4, attacking the queen. And because you tossed in this in-between move, bishop g4, attack the queen, the queen has to go. The only square available is queen e3. And uh, now you've got a lot of cool things to do. Uh, you could just take the pawn, that's perfectly fine. Now it's not defended enough, so you can capture it, and it's completely fine. But in a given position, there is an even stronger move, which is knight d4. You want to completely open up the center, so that you can take aim at the white's king, potentially, right? You want to take aim at white's king, you want to take advantage of white's underdeveloped position, and we want to attack. So we turn the table, instead of white trying to checkmate you quickly in the game, now we want to checkmate white in the right in the opening. And white will have to take your knight on d4. If not, this knight is attacking this one, it's attacking this one, therefore white has no choice but to take it. Now we recapture and we achieved an interesting result. We open up, opened up the e-file so that we can now attack. Now the queen is attacked, so white's going to ca capture here. We play rook e8, check to the king, it's got to move now. There aren't too many options. King d2 fails to a little but nice tactics it's knight to e4 check to the king and we're opening up this discovered attack to the queen so this bishop becomes really really powerful piece so that just loses for a while let's take it back now instead your opponent will probably play king to f1 putting the king to safety and now there is a really really spectacular little combo it's bishop e2 check and after king goes to g1 you go you play this evil move knight to d7 and that's something your opponent will clearly overlook because there is just no way to calculate this up front. The trick is the queen is captured, strangely enough, right in the middle of the board. And, you know, and the knight from d7 takes away this square. You know, the queen is attacked, so it can't go along this diagonal. The rook takes away this file, so the queen really has nothing to go. And while well, have to trade queen for your bishop, and so you're, you just win. So that's how you can crush white if you know what you're doing. And here is one more trick you gotta be aware of. Sometimes white, instead of playing queen h5 right away, will first play bishop c4, and after you respond something like knight c6 or bishop c5, white will then play queen h5. And what's the hope? White often hopes that you're gonna pre-move your move knight of 6 while waiting for white to play their move, you may pre-move knight of 6. And if that happens, after white plays queen h5 and computer automatically plays knight of 6, they can trick you into the scholar's checkmate once again. And I've checked it in the database, there are 2700 rated guys who lost just like that. So that stuff really does work for white, especially in bullet. Now, let's take it back. Of course, it just simply means that you shouldn't pre-move your very first moves. Now, we still go pawn g6, queen f3. Now, this square is under the attack, therefore we gotta cover it. Uh, we analyze knight e2. What if white plays pawn c3? That's another common move for white, which takes away this square completely. Well, your plan does not change at all. You still do all the same stuff. Bishop g7, solidifying your kingside position. After d3, we don't play symmetric move d6, because we know that in some variations, we want to strike with the move pawn d5, if possible. If not, you'll settle for d6, but you want to keep this option available. So we just cancel. After white goes bishop g5, we still kick it away right immediately with pawn h6. The bishop drops back, then you continue with pawn g5, and you're actually kind of winning the game right away. Uh, bishop g3 and all the same stuff. Despite our position being different, we still strike in the center with the move pawn d5. And our plan is just the same. Although the square is currently controlled by white three times, we know that on the next move we're gonna play this in-between move bishop g4, hit the queen, and as it drives away we will then be able to recapture on d5. So white takes here, we go bishop g4 first, attacking the queen, the queen goes here. Now, and as you may notice, the position is very similar to the previous variation. In the previous variation, we jumped here on knight d4, because there was no pawn there on c3. Now we can't, but we can just play the most straightforward move, knight takes d5, recapturing, attacking the queen. Potentially, the knight may even jump to f4 in the future, also uh, attacking a lot. Therefore, I'll probably have to take here. Now we recapture with the queen, and we're actually achieved a strategically winning position with so simple moves. Um, what's the point? Well, the queen from here attacks this pawn on g2, that's one thing to notice, and from there we're gonna attack the rook. Also, this pawn on d3 is really weak. We can just play rook d8 and then capture it. Or maybe bishop f5, you know, and capture it that way. 
Also, in some variations, you may even push your f pawn forward. That's really strong. We can play f5, f4, and actually capture this locked bishop. Because it is locked, it's not easy for the bishop to get out anyway. And with f5, f4, you can just win it. Therefore, you simply have way too many threats, and white has no compensation. White is just completely underdeveloped. Also, it's worth noticing that you just finished your main opening tasks and white is way behind. Now, what are the main opening tasks? It's really worth knowing because that is a universal principle that works in any opening, not just this one. You gotta develop your pieces, you get a castle, and you gotta connect the rooks by moving your queen out. Just like in this case, we move the queen out, and now our rooks are connected, so they uh, defend each other. Uh, this is a very useful principle to keep in mind. Mm. By the way, if you want to know all the main principles that you really need to master, I've got a free masterclass right about that, where I go more in-depth about this subject, which is my favorite subject in chess. That's what uh, makes you a strong player in no time, just by knowing the several most important key principles of chess. All right, let's continue. So here we attack the pawn. If I place pawn f3, trying to drive your bishop away and also to block this diagonal for your queen, you could, you could just go back and go after this pawn, and that's good enough for black. Computer recommends a completely brutal move pawn f5. You just completely ignore it. You say, hey, my position is so strong, I don't care about this bishop. I'm gonna to attack. And you're threatened pawn f4. If I captures here, you could play pawn f4, but queen takes g2 is even stronger because you want to capture the rook. If white plays queen f3, which is the only way to defend the rook th that way, then you say, okay. And you swing over to the queen side and you capture the other rook. <laughs> so, with this little dance around, you just completely destroy White's position. So, after you capture the rook, you're gonna capture the knight, you know, attack the king, and uh, that is a disaster for White. Finally, let's take a look at the other option of White, where White tries to play really safe and don't give you the chance to play this counter strike in the center. In this case, White's gonna go 92 first. That's the best move for White to cover the square. Now we play our plan, bishop g7, now it goes pawn d3, you castle. And now instead of going bishop g5, all that stuff right away, white says, hey, I want to take control of this square. And white goes knight c3, which is the correct thing to do. Now white really solidified their control over this square. They just defended it as much as they possibly could. So you can't play d5. Then you have to sell for d6, which is still fine. It's just a normal move. Now white goes bishop g5. You still play h6, as always. You do need to worry about this spin a little bit, because if white goes knight e5, you know, and hit this knight, that's going to be a big problem. So pawn h6 solves the problem easily. If bishop goes back there to h4, you're happy. You know that you can lock it there on the king side, where it's completely passive, out of the game. And what are you going to do here? You can't play d5 anymore, you sell it for d6. Ideally speaking, you still want to look for ways to attack white in the center. And in this particular position, that way exists. It's the move knight to d4. We're going to analyze this in a moment. But just in case, let me tell you that. If white plays some other moves, and you don't have the move knight d4 for some reason in that particular position you're playing, then you've got another standard simple move bishop e6. That's what you can play you know, in any position, regardless of what your opponent does. And uh, you just finalize your development once again. You neutralize this active bishop. If white ever takes here on e6, you're happy. After you recapture, now your rook, uh, you know, just gets engaged into the game. And uh, that's pretty annoying for white, actually, because it, it's opposite to white's queen. And yeah, that already feels uncomfortable. Therefore, that's how you play if white plays something unexpected that we didn't analyze and you're not sure what to do. But in the current position, you've got still the way to attack in the center with a move knight to d4. This is a fork to the queen and the pawn on here on c2, therefore white must capture. We recapture with a pawn, attacking this knight. Where can it go? If it goes knight e2, we're happy once again. We're happy all around, because, you know, we are happy people. Bishop g4, and the queen is captured. Nice. If not that, white's gonna play knight d5. Looks like a really good move for white. Pulling the knight in the center, looks like white's gonna attack you here with h4, castle queen side, and just have a great attack on the king side. But you play another unexpected move, knight h7. What's the point? Why would you put your bishop, on, uh, your knight on the edge? It turns out that, strangely enough, this knight on d5, although looks nice at first, but it's nearly trapped, because our pawns are doing a great job taking away all the squares where the knight could possibly retreat. And our plan is just to play c6 and to win the knight, and it's actually not easy for white to stop this at all. If white castles or plays any move, you just play pawn c6, attack the knight. The only square for the knight to go to can go here, can go here. The only square is knight b4, and after that you just finish it off with a move pawn e5, and now the knight is dead. You're gonna capture it and continue your attack on the queen side.
So that's the final version where white tried to play safe, but we found a way to punish white anyway. And let's finish it off with a nice little quiz for you. I took this position from the recent tournament, the game between Dinkleram playing white against Fun Forest playing black. It is white to move and win. And if you can't find the winning shot for white, please write it down in the comments below. And if you can't find it, just scroll to the comments and somebody will point out the correct move. The Scholar's Checkmate is not the only trick they're gonna try against you. And this video covers the top four opening mistakes after pawn e4 on the first move, so you may wish to check this out. Also, if you want to explore on the main principles that I referred to previously, you may check out this free masterclass by clicking over there. Keep crushing it, talk soon.